us on the topic building blocks for a trillion dollar digital economy by Mr. Amitabh Kant, CEO Niti Aayog. Joining us in the session, we have Mr. Ajit Mohan, Vice President and Managing Director, India of Facebook. Mr. Mohan, I hand over the proceedings to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and Amitabh, uh, welcome. Uh, Mr. Kant is the CEO of Niti, uh, someone who is quite familiar to all of us in the tech industry as a big promoter of digital campaigns, new technology, uh, and global collaboration broadly. He's, of course, the author of Branding India, an incredible story, um, as well as someone who's, who's been behind Make in India, Startup India, Incredible India. And of course, while I was growing up in Kerala many, many years ago, the author of the tourism initiative of God's Own Country uh, in the 80s in Kerala. Uh, Amitabh, welcome to the session. Uh, Thanks. Amitabh, Thank you. Diving in and straight away, given the theme that we're exploring is the is the ambition to create a trillion dollar digital economy. And, and when I think about it, uh, it, it almost seems like there are three parts to it, at least in my mind. There's one, how do we think about building up the technical talent in India, especially around engineers? The second is all of the work around building the right domestic environment for innovation. Uh, and then third, how we engage with the world. Uh, I'm wondering, how do you think about it uh, on each of these three, or is there a different framework that you bring in when you're driving uh, the thinking about the trillion dollar digital economy at Niti? Yeah, uh, so Ajit, uh, firstly that uh, we have over, over a billion, uh, over a half a billion internet users and uh, their number is rising rapidly in every part of the country. And this will create a huge market for a host of digital services, platforms, application, content, and solutions. Uh, and my view is that uh, as we move towards uh, including uh, use through regional languages, India would see a, a five-fold increase in economic value from digital transformation by 2025. And this represents a very, very huge opportunity for both global and local businesses, startups and innovators. Uh, you know, particularly in emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, uh, in ways that are customized to India's needs. But one thing is very clear that, you know, India needs many more uh, people with uh, specialized background of, uh, you know, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we need many more data scientists. Uh, we have a lot of engineers. It's not that there is a shortage of engineers, but you need great, uh, you know, product designers. There's a huge shortage of great product designers. And uh, there's a great uh, uh, shortage of data scientists. And therefore, my view is that uh, Indian academic institutions need to restructure their curriculum to create uh, and this is a huge amount of focus needs to be laid on emerging areas of technology. Merely producing great number of uh, electric and electronic engineers is not adequate. You need product designers. And therefore, uh, you know, and th that is where great amount of value can be created. And I think each one of our institutions need to really do work around this. And my view is that India can actually create up to uh, a trillion, one trillion of economic value from digital economy by 2025, up from around 200 billion currently. And uh, we have a huge potential uh, in a whole range of areas. Secondly, I think the other big challenge is really that India has vast number of challenges. And these challenges are uh, relating to our national priorities such as healthcare, education, energy, and about doubling farmers' income. Uh, because these are challenges which no other country faces what India faces. Our engineers and our scientists must be able to find technology to find solutions to these challenges. And without technological leapfrogging, we will not be able to find solutions. The traditional way of looking at things and doing things will not help. We need technology to leapfrog. And if we are able to do this, and actually if you look at agriculture field, 
there are huge number of uh, uh, startups doing some very innovative work which needs to be uh, taken forward. And if we are able to find solutions to our problems, we'll actually be finding solutions to the world's problem. So it's not about 1.3 billion people of India, but for next five or six billion people. And thirdly, uh, my view is that uh, fintech area is a huge area of uh, uh, explosion. That's an area because you have the Jam Trinity, you have the UPI, so you've created the basic platforms. And on top of this, you've allowed private sector to innovate and grow. So you have Google Pay, you have Phone Pay, you have Amazon Pay, you have Paytm. Uh, and India has allowed all these, uh, unlike China, we've allowed big companies to come in and we've allowed Indian players to come in. And Indian players are actually competing with the world's best. Uh, today and therefore if I was just comparing the figure of Google Pay versus Phone Pay and I, I found uh, Phone Pay has done extremely well on on uh, UPI actually it has done uh, as you know a little better than Google Pay so what it shows is that Indian entrepreneurs have taken on the world in this and therefore these are these this, these are my initial thoughts that uh, once you and now with this Bharat net spreading out into the rural areas of India and Prime Minister saying that we cover all the rural villages in the next thousand days. Uh, once you have Bharat net across the rural areas, the technological transformation of India will happen through technology. I look after these aspirational districts, some of the most backward, the most dis difficult districts of India. And I find that uh, when I visit them, I find that more than physical infrastructure of roads, they need uh, this, uh, they need uh, internet connectivity and that will help us to improve health and uh, education outcomes in these areas. You, you've always uh, brought the conversation to the aspirational districts, uh, you know, every time we have met Amitabh. I'm curious, you engaged with a lot of entrepreneurs uh, in the tech industry, how much energy are you seeing from the tech industry as well as these entrepreneurs in terms of focusing on the needs and opportunities of those aspirational districts? Yeah, so, you know, the aspirational districts, as I said, cover about roughly 20% uh, of India's population. They are some of the most backward, the most difficult district, but in the last uh, two and a half years, we've seen radical transformation. The key to that has been the use of one real-time data. Uh, we, when I was a collector in Kerala and Calicut, uh, the data available, available to me was about five to six years back. And later I worked in, with the fishermen, the traditional fishermen of Kerala to introduce beach level auctions and new technology. They're opening a bank account for traditional, you know, the, I could give them new outboard motors, give them new fishing crafts, uh, fiberglass crafts, which enable them to go much further into the sea. I could give them new fishing nets, but opening a bank account was a nightmare. It used to take, I used to run after bank managers. It used to know your customer it used to take seven to eight months then. But the real transformation that has happened in these aspirational districts also is that one is that real time data is available. And secondly, uh, you are able to get bank accounts have been opened for the people of in these areas. So with bank accounts, you have today 135,000 uh, crores lying in the bank accounts of uh, these people in many of these areas of the new bank accounts that have opened. And therefore, what has happened is that today, a woman has a bank account, she has some money in her account, and we've digitally enabled her. So that is the big thing that's happened in these aspirational districts. The other is that today you are able to use data to put out their ranking in public domain. You are able to say that this district has done well, this district has not done well, and you are able to challenge them. You can name and shame their performance. And once you start putting them in public domain, the state departments, the state chief ministers also notice it. And that is making a difference. And this to my mind is the key. The third thing is that we work with a lot of tech companies and we work with a lot of 
you know, uh, good NGOs. We work with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We work with uh, Piramal Trust. We work with Tata Trust really to do innovative things in these areas on improving nutrition and health and education. And all of them have done transformational work. And several startups have done some very, very innovative work in these districts. In fact, okay. we'd be very happy to show, showcase some of this unique work to your organization. No, we would we would love to, and and let's find a way to showcase those, Amitabh. Um, you mentioned this. Um, it, it feels like two big things happened in the last five years, Amitabh. One was the explosion in access to the internet. Uh, it happened in a very short period of time, where you have 700, 800 million people, and the number uh, ticking up. And the second thing is in the last few months uh, with the pandemic. It seems like there has been an acceleration of digital behavior. I can share with you that in the last six months, uh, we are seeing across our platforms, Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, not just people's usage of the platforms, Amitabh, but businesses using them to be a lot more ambitious about growth, not just in India, but global growth in ways that was not true even 12 months ago. I'm curious whether you are seeing that as well, where you sit. And, and are you thinking now that with the combination of the two, we could be even more ambitious than we were even 12 months ago about the digital economy that can be built in India and in India for the world? No, so that's a very, very important uh, point that you're making. And it becomes so obvious if you look at the huge growth in uh, UPI, for instance, the Unified Payment Interface. Uh, UPI has just grown uh, many fold during the, this period. And what I've seen is that uh, India's digital divide is narrowing fast uh, during this period. We've been able to use technology across a range of areas. Uh, and the good thing that has happened is uh, that India has also worked, and many of the startups have worked with us on seeing how the post COVID era. The post-COVID era is going to change globally and only those countries will grow which can use, create economic value from digital economy and that is really the crux of it. So I think supply chains will get restructured. Uh, they will move uh, from one country to many countries. You have to be competitive. And you can be competitive only if you use the power of technology. And that is one of the key things that we've done during this period is not only that we've carried out radical structural reforms across a range of areas which the Prime Minister has led, across a whole range of areas, uh, across coal, mining, definition of MSME, agriculture, many areas. But we've uh, really focused on improving the supply chain networks. And one of the things we did was to come out with the production linked incentive scheme. And the production linked incentive scheme really looks at identifying 10 key areas. And in these 10 key areas, create global champions and become a key manufacturing nation for the world in these areas. Electronics and mobile manufacturing and electronics uh, have been identified and we've received very, very good response in these areas. So our view is, and our, uh, our belief is that India will emerge, uh, we've allocated about 26 billion. Uh, this should lead because it's about 5% of the production that we are giving as a production linked incentive. In five years time, this should lead to $520 billion worth of production in India. And our view is that India must emerge as a global champion in these 10 areas and global supply chains must reloc should logically relocate to India as a consequence of this, particularly in some of the cutting edge areas that we've picked up, like uh, mobile, electronics, uh, uh, you know, battery manufacturing, uh, several of these automobile, many of these areas. And therefore this PLI will give a much needed fillip to the country's uh, manufacturing. Uh, thank you, Abhidab. You, you mentioned fintech many times, including UPI, and, and I think it's fairly established that there's not much of a parallel to the backbone that was created in UPI anywhere in the world, uh, creating an agnostic 
a platform that connects the entire banking industry and still uh, opening it up for innovation uh, to players, whether it's, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, phone pay, Google pay, WhatsApp pay was finally launched last year. I'm curious about, would you think about the same kind of a backbone framework for the three sectors that you called out, energy, education, and healthcare? Was there something about financial services that enabled the creation of a, you know, a pipeline or a platform like UPI that is more difficult in those other three sectors, or is it just a matter of time? Actually, the key was that financial inclusion was one of the major goals that the government strived to achieve. And actually, uh, this is really was the key. And the journey started with the launch of uh, Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana in 2014. And uh, the vision of the government was to ensure universality of access to banking services. Many of us were skeptical about it at that point of time. But as I speak now, nearly 42 crores beneficiary of bank so far and a total of 135,000 crores, as I said, balance is currently in PMJDY accounts. Now, powered by India stack in Jam Trinity, Jandan has truly brought to life universal access and equity among a billion plus Indians with 50% of its account holders being women. Now, the Jam architecture also democratized the access to financial services and, you know, that enabled India to make the leap beyond financial inclusion into financial integration via UPI. India's, you know, and India's biggest payment success story, uh, and, you know, uh, it has enabled real-time payments, secure payments through bank accounts of an individual and with provisions like zero balance bank accounts and mobile banking on feature phones. Jandan really provided access to a bouquet of services uh, ranging from credit, insurance, remittance, and pension schemes. Uh, the direct benefit transfer reforms, you know, and this has been the key to India's financial inclusion, the direct benefit transfer reform. You know, when I was a young officer, money used to be transferred from central government to state government, state government to district, districts to villages, and one of our prime ministers then had said that only 15 paisa out of a rupee reaches the poor person. But the DBT reforms powered by UPI's backboard brought in the next phase of inclusion. And actually, this ensured that 100% reaches the actual benef beneficiary. So DBT has enabled the central government to disburse about 31,000 crores as financial assistance. During the lockdown period, more than 33.25 crores within weeks was disbursed. And then what RBI did was it enabled video K KVCI, uh, video know your customer accounts, uh, enabled contactless finance for account opening purposes. So they, all this, and actually India's lower income groups access to appropriately sized priced financial products has been increasing at a great scale because of all this. And this is the unique feature of unique feature of India's fintech revolution. Thank you. I, I see a lot of uh, questions coming in, Amitabh. And, and a lot of it is about uh, how is the government aiding the transformation of digital? I think you spoke uh, about many of it. I have two qu specific questions that I think uh, would be helpful to double click into one is around what you mentioned, digital reaching rural areas, the aspirational districts. Are you worried about whether from an access point of view or from uh, these districts being able to fully exploit the power of digital? Are you worried about uh, inequality or do you feel like the benefits of digital are showing up in those dis districts as well adequately? No, I'm not worried at all. And in fact, uh, my strong belief is that small shop owners, farmers, traders, MSME entrepreneurs, rural self-help groups, the gig economy workers are increasingly generating uh, digital transaction history. And this digital transaction history could be, would be used to inform 
and build trust with financial institutions. And what will happen is that in the next phase of financial inclusion would be driven through leveraging this data pool and consent based data sharing would be the key enabler for effectively using this data, the history and enabling further integration of the marginalized and enable access to a bouquet of formal financial products like credit, insurance, pension, all will flow. All this will flow to the poor people because of the availability of data. The history of and the history will enable us, the history of the digital transaction history will enable us to spread credit, insurance and pension rather than at the will of the bank manager or the branch managers. All this will be because of data. And therefore, you know, Niti Aayog recently released the data empowerment and protection architecture. DEPA, which we have recently released, and that will allow uh, Indian citizens to share their financial data securely to help them access the right financial product for themselves. So together with the other layers of India stack, the right finance, you know, DEPA could do for India's data ecosystem what the internet did for communication. And that will really, you know, you will see an explosion of novel products and services that will empower people. So we need to break data silos and monopolies. We'll allow fintech companies to compete on product design, analytics, value creation. Uh, and this will be a huge, huge game changer in due course. Uh, Amitabh, we covered this in the last conversation as well. Uh, and I've seen you go out of your way to clarify that uh, an Atman Nirbhar Bharat doesn't mean an India that is less engaged with the world or less open to investments and capital uh, uh, and, and energy of companies around the world. Uh, a lot of the conversation sometimes gets reduced to an us versus them. Whereas the language that I see from you is focused on how do we leverage the power of all stakeholders to make sure India's outcomes are positive. How do you think about it? How do you think about globalization and, and making sure that India's interests are served while still being a country that remains open to the world and making sure that we leverage all the technical progress that comes from being open to the world? No, so Atma Nirbhar Bharat is not about protectionism. It's about making India an integral part of the global economy. It's about using the domestic market as a springboard for exports. No country in the world post-World War II has become rich without penetrating global markets and without opening up its markets. We are great believers in the fact that uh, we, India must become an integral part of global supply chains and this would require us to become domestically competitive. You can't become a part of global supply chain without being domestically competitive. The more domestically competitive you are, you, will, you need to keep your yourself a very active player in global economy and that would require us to constantly interact with the rest of the world. We need constantly to become an integral part of the supply chain and we need to become a major exporting nation. Without that, it will not be possible for India to grow richer and richer and richer and create wealth for its people over the next three decade period. If India is to grow at 9 to 10% over a three decade period, it must be open, it must be an integral part of the global economy, it must be an integral part of the global supply chain. Amitabh, the last question, uh, and, and we are, we are going, getting to the end of the session. Um, if you look at April to August 2020, we had one of our largest FDI inflows ever. Uh, when you look at some of the uh, growth numbers, the last six months has seen explosion of innovation and digital. Um, for all of the fairly ambitious targets that have been set, do you at Neeti look at the last nine and 12 months and what's happening in digital and think, maybe we should raise our ambitions even more. Maybe there are other sectors that India should be making a claim on. Are you? How are you thinking about this this acceleration? And how are you thinking about uh, setting the framework for the next five to ten years, given what's happened in the last year? So that's a very important question because what uh, uh, COVID has shown to us that every crisis is an opportunity, 
and it's for us to really tap into that opportunity we were once uh, you know not making masks we were not making ventilators we were not making ppe today we are exporting them a uh, great ex example of all this is the two vaccines that have been made in india we are the vaccine capital of the world we make about 70% of the world's vaccines and similarly in each one of these areas whether it's uh, battery storage whether it's uh, solar manufacturing whether it's uh, you know mobile we need to look at where the world will be 5 years from now and look at those technologies where the world will be 5 years now and get into size and scales of those technologies now for you to really get into the sunrise areas of growth and bring in global manufacturing global size and scale is important to think big and large is important to get into new technologies is important using digital technology to make a quantum jump and a leapfrog is is the will be the key and i think our ambition the fact that upi in 4 years has become bigger than mastercard and in the next 3 years will become bigger than visa and uh, you know uh, really demonstrates the fact that if you got the right platform technologically you can use the size and strength of your democracy to really make huge huge uh, uh, innovation reforms and that is what india needs to do really disrupt the disrupt india's economy through the use of technology to make big jump in the global markets uh, mr amitabh khan always fabulous talking to you thank you so much for your time Thanks, Ajit. Great pleasure. Great pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Kant, and thank you, Mr. Ajit, for this wonderful session. We would also like to thank our partners, Revery Language Technologies, Philosophy, Credit Watch, Insurance, Wise, for supporting the 15th Ideas. With that, we end this session. Stay tuned for the other sessions. Stay safe. Goodbye.